the uh, recording in progress. So yeah, thank you so much. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening based on the time zone. So I believe everyone is in the Asian region. <laughs> uh, so definitely a uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon to most of us. Uh, so thank you so much for joining the Open Data and Open House uh, session for Ocean. SC and Oceana region. So the Open Data uh, Open House is a series of events organized by Open Data Charter uh, to celebrate International Open Data Day uh, throughout the month of March. So although the Open Data Day is uh, focused on the first week of March uh, from Open Data Charter, we look forward and we have been like trying this since last year to celebrate it throughout the throughout throughout the month of March. So the idea behind the house is to uh, give space uh, to organization and government um, from Open Data Charter community uh, to showcase the uh, work they are doing. So this is the final session for the Open Data and Open House session. Uh, the three of the uh, Open House has been like already organized, one focusing on uh, North America region, one focusing on Africa and Europe region, and one focusing on Latin uh, Latin region. So. Uh, talking about the modality of the uh, open house, so talking about the overall structure of today's session. So, uh, although we, like we try our best, like keep it very informal, uh, so one can have presentation slides. One can also uh, easily share uh, what they what their experience are. So, uh, we have definitely the four amazing speaker. Uh, so who are joined with us, and uh, we'll be sharing the uh, work they have been doing uh, in the field of data technology. Uh, any anything so so they will be highlighting the key activities they are doing uh the success and failures uh on on the work on the activities that we have been doing and also um uh, uh, like highlight what can be improved in terms of regional partnership in terms of the uh initiatives and uh, and and many more uh in terms of key reflections and all uh so each speaker has 10 to uh, 13 minutes to share and if there is like uh, enough time remains in the end of the sessions we can have uh, some level of um, discussions or query sessions in terms of the work that we have been like doing kinds of stuff so uh, so without being further delayed uh, delayed so uh, we are like maybe let's let's keep it done very on time so thank you once again so um, I would love to welcome our first speaker uh, I try. So uh, I'm so sorry if I pronounce the name wrong. So I will try my best to like pronounce this way. Right? So he's the executive director of Open Data. Uh, sorry, Open Open Data Cambodia. So uh, as an executive director, he plays an important role on increasing public access to current and historical data and information about Cambodian uh, development trends in online uh, open data platform. Uh, so yeah, over to you, Thai. Uh, for for your uh, presentation and sharing, so thank you again. Thank uh, Nikesh for having me and uh, today, and thank everyone for uh, joining this important event. Uh, so I would say that it's my first time to join the regional uh, discussion on Open Data Day, Open uh, uh, what do you Open House, <laughs> Open Data House. Uh, so. Um, so my name is Titri. I'm a security director of uh, Open Development Cambodia. We are a local organization and based in Phnom Penh. We have over country partner in the Mekong region, uh, Open Development Thailand, Vietnam, Laos, and Myanmar. We also have the regional portal called Open Development Mekong. So we use only one IT architecture to run the open data project in Cambodia. And uh, for the uh, so over project start. Uh, since 2011 and um, at the time you know like the open data uh, uh, movement or initiatives it's uh, it's still I would say not uh, widely discussed or say in Cambodia but uh, now we uh, I'm so excited to have a lot of uh, open data community and especially in my uh, presentation or discussion here, I will emphasize some important progress uh, of both policy and also the internal awareness raising program. So uh, I would start with the um, um, awareness raising program. So ODC has been in, uh, uh, like uh, uh, play over important role to raise awareness raising. Uh, we start with the translation of the open data handbook into Khmer and we run uh, through that, we run several, several hackathon events uh, using the data for 
you know, like uh, decision making process or a project prototype to address the social and environmental issue, you know. And this year is a very uh, special event uh, that we host, not only just celebrate the Open Data Day only um, early March, but uh, uh, last two days uh, on 26, 27, uh, ODC hosts the big uh, national Open Data Conference. And this event not just, you know, like, uh, uh, how the, the debate and discussion, but we also have uh, around 10 um, hackathon um, uh, um, project or event as well uh, with the uh, youth and other community involved with this. Um, uh, for now, I would say that the Cambodian government and together with the civil society, we make a lot of progress uh, and I'm very happy to hear that Cambodian government are working on the new uh, open data policy as well and uh, they uh, very keen to involve ODC and other stakeholders to be part of the discussion and dialogue as well. Uh, but from civil society, I would say that, uh, you know, like, um, even we have experience with open data for the last 10 years, but when it comes to policy development, it's still, you know, like something that we need to, to work together with our uh, regional and global open data community, especially, you know, with open data chapter and other open data community as well, you know, and and maybe we can change further what uh, civil society so civil society should prepare and be really involved with the uh, policy development and this is very important in cambodian context especially while cambodian right now we are you know i would say absent of the access to information law so open data data governance law it come it become to the very important aspect to increase the you know, like storytelling through data and other uh, project that uh, Cambodian uh, civil society and uh, uh, community as a whole, they are waiting for for a long time to go, you know. So that uh, aspect of the, um, the policy and regulation. So again, uh, I would say that we are ready to be part of the uh the the policy development process and uh we will reach out to you all because you are uh, you know the expert uh, in 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 this uh, area you know so hopefully that we can adapt or maybe learn from key principles that we need to integrate into the new open data policy in cambodia and uh, one more thing i would like to emphasize about the uh, the data and, um, and sustainable development goal you know so back to uh, 2019 Cambodian um, is a uh, you know like a first time for a government uh, uh, to report the the progress of the uh, the report the VNR report at the UN high level political forum and at the time uh, we learn a lot you know from the civil society and also government because uh, in um, in uh, Cambodian uh, we don't have the I'm talking about civil society and also government, like government, they don't have a centralized database that can easily monitor the progress of the Cambodian Sustainable Development Goal, you know, and from uh, civil society, we also uh, uh, raise a lot of concern around, around that. And luckily, uh, I would say that one of the key recommendations from civil society has been integrated into the uh, uh, a top priority of the recommendation uh, for the government and development uh, agency around uh, develop a open uh, data po portal uh, mainly to monitor based on the uh, the key indicator of the Cambodian Sustainable Development Goal. And for now, the the portal is still um, still progress. Um, and uh, we uh, from civil society like ODC, uh, um, my organization, we also. Uh, produce the uh, the uh, the progress um, uh, report based on the indicator, but uh, we we not supposed to share those report to the UN. But generally, we just provide the overview on the progress of each uh, SDG goal, so that uh, over community stakeholder here they can uh, you know like aware about the progress and what are the challenges uh, of that. Uh, for the for the portal uh, yesterday I um, uh, uh, have a chance to discuss with the Ministry of Planning who in charge of the open data on uh, SDG uh, and they share with us a lot of uh, challenges and obstacles because 
inside the government system they uh, they i mean in terms of data sharing it's still a big issue you know they're not willing to share and talk to each other so it needs uh, you know like the uh, the agency or military organization that uh, uh, can can coordinate with that you know so we still discuss what overall can can support and not only just about data sharing but when it comes to the data uh, you know, like you all of you are aware about the open data standard. I don't know how to emphasize about that, but uh, the level of sharing data now is still like uh, I would say the PDF file, and it's very hard for the Ministry of uh, Planning, especially the National Institute of Statistics. Uh, they need to, you know, like re-entry. You know, so that take a lot of time, and they still not find the best uh, solution how how they can work. Uh, together in this area as well you know so again i could uh, emphasize a lot uh, about the progress of the uh, like open data on the sustainable development goal and also the new uh, open data, uh, data policy uh, from civil societies um, i mean a lot of issue that we need to address together because uh, even the concept has been introduced to a relevant stakeholder, but when it comes to the data sharing, it's still, you know, like uh, something that we need to discuss and, uh, uh, you know, work together to build trust among stakeholders, you know, be without building trust amongst the key stakeholder, um, the data not um, widely uh, share or disseminate among the uh, community and also a key stakeholder as well. And, uh, again, for the uh, program on the, the, the data literacy, the, we put a lot of effort to do the training and capacity building for civil society. And we have noticed that a lot of story now, it's, you know, like the user data for their storytelling. So this, this is something that um, I would say that it um, have a, a strong evidence um, and, and justification for uh, policymaker and relevant stakeholder who uh, need to uh, address those issues as well. And we not only just train to civil society, but also we provide some capacity building to the government agency as well. So I'm uh, stopped for now, but I'm very happy to uh, to, to say more and learn from uh, our team here. I know that uh, you know our team here has a lot of experience in this area. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Thai. I think this is very interesting. I can and, and I I can personally relate to mo most of the activities and the uh, issues that you are like highlighting. Uh, being come from uh, the South Asian background, we also have similar kinds of experience in terms of policy, in terms of data interoperability, and many of the uh, things. Uh, so thank you so much for uh, setting and highlighting. Uh, all, uh, all the activities that you have been doing and, and uh, definitely the uh, Cambodian government is leading. So if the time remains in the end, I definitely look forward to like discuss how we can like uh, build this regional alliance as for uh, the open data initiatives and at the same time uh, to advocate for data interoperability and data sharing and stuff. So thank you so much. And I really look forward to like, the upcoming discussion too. Uh, so with that being said, let's move out, uh, move for our uh, the uh, second sharing uh, uh, for for today's sessions. So for the uh, second presentations and sharing, I would like to uh, welcome uh, Michael Carnes. So he's the researcher for Open Data, State of Open Data, and the uh, founder and strategic advisor for Step Up Consulting. So he's currently the program performance and quality advisors for the. Making Australian Partnership Water, Energy, and Climate uh, Program based on Australian Embassy in Bangkok. So Miko is a Ford, uh, Ford Foundation's International Fellow and is currently finishing his uh, doctoral degree in Knowledge and Innovations uh, Management from the Institutes of Knowledge and Innovation South East Asia, a Central of Excellence housed at Bangkok University. So um, uh, uh, over to you, Michael. Uh, Miko, I say, <laughs> because lots of friends, his friends say it's him uh, for, for your presentation and sharing. Uh, thanks very much, Nikesh, and thanks for the invitation to, to share uh, in this forum. And uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining today in this discussion. It's really excited with this one. I'd probably be doing a, a little bit of a, a, a few provocative questions uh, rather than uh, think about uh, just to push the conversation forward. And I don't know if I can share screen, but I don't think I can do that. But uh, if I can... Uh, 
you, you can share it. I can I can give you the access. Okay, that would be that would be good. So um yeah um I currently uh I currently how do you call it uh revise the most recent uh the most uh, I I revise the chapter on open data in South Southeast and Southeast Asia and um yeah can you see the screen now. Yeah, okay, great. So, and uh, these are the questions that I'd like to ask or provocations that I'd like to say. And very good that I actually came after T uh, because it's it, it, it's a good segue to that. So I think my question, the question that I still have now, I've been involved in the open data space for more than 10 years now. I used to be the chief design uh, strategist for uh, the open data lab in Jakarta some six, seven years ago. And I think the question for me at this stage should be, does open data still hold the promise we thought it would fulfill? So um, I was really smiling quite a bit uh, when T was actually doing his presentation because you know the same kind of things that we've been asking ourselves like some five to six years ago, uh, are there still the same kinds of questions that we're actually asking up until now? And uh, in the update to the open data chapter for the region, I was actually saying that little has actually changed and uh, therefore, there's really that big challenge for us to actually move that conversation forward. So um, one of the things that I'm actually fascinated these days is the concept of data empowerment. Because, you know, it's much, much more. I run this blog together with Andy Poveke, and we were actually talking about, you know, it's not just actually about disclosure of data. It's not just actually about publication of data. But it's actually about how the data is actually being used and impacting lives of people on the ground. Uh, because at the end of the day, we will get to be fatigued <laughs> with publication. Uh, I'm really glad that Open Data, Open Development Cambodia is still not tired of doing the kinds of things that they do because they, I still use their portal for a lot of things, by the way. But just to say that, you know, there's no singular route to better, better transparency and account, more accountability. And I was kind of thinking that, you know, if we think about an open data, open data as a silver bullet that actually cures all of these ills in the world regarding transparency and accountability in government, then we might probably be in the wrong place. Because I think we have to think systems and we think, have to think about how, for example, our sets of things that we, the sets of the things that we do are actually contributing to that whole range of activism towards better openness and accountability. And it's really good that, you know, uh, uh, the Open Development Cambodia exists primarily because those intermediation processes are needed, but we have to have those universities to treat for, to teach, for example, uh, students of data literacy. We need to have civil society organizations working on the level of the ground to be able to make sure that they understand what's the data out there and how they can use it for them, themselves. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that we really have to do and we have to actually connect our advocacy and movement with all others that are working in this space. The second thing that I'd like to say is that you know, in the data ecosystem, stakeholder categories and relationships are, flu are fluid and defies rigid definition. So you remember some five to seven years ago, we we're talking about suppliers and you know, producers and users and so on. And in one of the projects that I was involved in, um, uh, the Open Data and Developing Co Economies book that was edited by Stefan Verhoes and Andrew of the GovLab, we're actually looking at, for example, supply, users, and so on and so forth. And supply being, for example, government in one in one sense. But if you look at the context of Cambodia, for example, and then I go back to the, these. Actually, if you look at Cambodia, there is no government-led open data initiative. The open data initiative is actually Open Development Cambodia. So if I like, for example, to see uh, supply of data on X, Y, and Z, it actually Open Development Cambodia is actually doing that to me. Uh, primarily because they have the expertise to do that, they parse data. That's the reason why they're actually talking about you know, open data for SDGs. And they're actually thinking, oh, what would be my role here? What would be our role here? Because of course, government actually does not have the capacity and sometimes the lack of interest actually to pursue all of this task of us actually converting PDF files into something that's machine readable. So it defies categorization. So I am currently a, I am currently a part of the Global Data Barometer Research Advisory Board. And there was a question there, is there a open, open government data initiative in the country? I was like saying, there's none. But what about if that open government data initiative, what, what about open government data initiative that is done by the CSO? Like in the case for Cambodia, how do we rate that country there? You know, so there, there are those questions because uh, suppliers, producers, users actually defies that rigid categorization. Look at this one, for example. 
this is a data collector at the level of the Mekong River, actually measuring how much is the water level at some point in time. This is a user and a producer at the same time. That, that, actually, it's yes, right? He produces his own data. He, she produces her own data that's being used by their community and actually uses it for decision-making processes as well. So we have to think about those rigid categorizations as very fluid. Third, I would like to say that data accessibility and understanding may be more important than our fascination with formats and licenses. Uh, because you know we keep on saying you know we have to uh, we have to treat can rate countries about openness blah 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 and we're talking about is this is, is the data set open but for me at least at the very basic thing we have to look at is data accessible and we can can we understand the data can we actually convert it into something that's useful for other purposes for example so um um yeah but <laughs> going back to three these example for example uh, how do you actually deal with PDFs, right? If, for example, government is willing to pour, pour that out publicly, that are we still saying that that is a closed data? Maybe by strict definition, yes, but maybe not necessarily the case, primarily because of the intention, intention to be open there. Yeah, so this is the open barometer edition in the first, second, and third. And if you come to take a look at it, the data available online is actually high, but all of these are PDFs or what have you. But the the data availab availability is high, but the open data op data openness is actually significant though, and that has not actually changed uh, quite significantly since then, because you know there is no infrastructure within a lot of governments in the region to actually convert that into a format that we can actually call open data. Finally, and then my last point here is. Our advocacy for openness and use may also be a cause for greater opacity and use restrictions. We have to be very careful about this. Um, I've seen, for example, in a lot of contexts in the region, and I don't want to name countries here, but that you know, people's advocacy towards greater openness actually has shifted to more closing down of several aspects of participation. And there are a lot of countries in the region, for example, that even the basic the basic requirement of actually to self-organize or even for CSOs to actually operate or even for donors even to actually do something, uh, those restrictions are actually uh, built into place. You cannot talk, for example, about you know natural resource governance, but you can talk about climate change because climate change is a much more fancier name. And then if you talk about natural resource governance or water governance, and they will say, no, 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 that cannot be. You can so. Um, the, the choice of the language that we do sometimes affects significantly how governments react in terms of openness. And therefore, sometimes our cause, our, our advocacy for these types of things are actually leading towards a lot of restrictions. And I think that's the reason why, for example, there's less and less impact that you can see. There's a data use, for example, that you can see in the data global barometer uh, that's happening but less and less impact primarily of that restrictive environment where a lot of us in the region operate. So I'll stop there and thanks very much for this time. I know that it's not something that you're actually ex 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 expecting from this, but yeah, just put, just putting out those questions out there. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. I think this is very uh, interesting perspective uh, that you presented uh, in terms of cohesions. Uh, I, I personally find it very uh, insightful because like in the Open Knowledge Foundation network also, we usually discuss the regional perspective and see how the shift of focus has been like moving from open data to some other uh, perspective that you mentioned, the climate change, natural resources, and because there are lot, lots of hot topics uh, running and they, like uh, later is Stephen from uh, the Australia uh, who is leading the uh, second uh, co-stewardship uh, can also pause me. And in terms of also the the, open data initiative in the national government, for example, you gave the example of Cambodia, which is almost similar to Nepal also, they were, civil society has been like leading lots of open data initiative, but there are very few initiatives uh, run by the national or central governments to push that momentum forward. So yeah, definitely, I think that's that's a very interesting uh, perspective and cohesion to discuss and explore and really looking forward to the uh, upcoming discussions too. Thank you so much.
Uh, so let's move forward uh, with our thought presentation because like uh, once we are done with the presentation, I'm trying my best to like find some additional time later in the uh, session so that we can like have some some level of discussion running. So for the thought presentation, I'd love to uh, welcome and like pass this platform to the uh, Susui uh, from the uh, Asian Democratic uh, Network. So she is currently the senior program manager at the uh, ADN and has been like coordinating various advocacy projects and initiatives promoting democracy and human rights in the Asia at the uh, ADN. So, uh, Susi, uh, over to you for your presentation and sharing. Great. Thank you, Nikesh. Um, may I get access to sh share my screen? Uh, sure, please give me Great. one second. Um, I'll go ahead and get started. Thank you uh, for that great introduction and this opportunity to speak uh, at this uh, open house. Uh, it's I think it's a great start uh, for us, uh, me, uh, as a representative of the Asia Democracy Network to better understand open data and listen to about the great work uh, that various organizations in the region are doing on open data. And already just listening to the past two uh, presentations, I was uh, coming up with, oh, how can we, you know, partner and collaborate and how can we, uh, you know, incorporate uh, open data into our program. So uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but let me go ahead and share my presentation. Um, so, oh, can you guys see my presentation? Yeah. Oh, uh, yes. Okay. Great. So today I'll, I'll just do a brief introduction about um, the Asia Democracy Network, about who we are and uh, what kind of work that we do. Um, we've been around for 10 years since uh, 2013. We were launched uh, by uh, In Seoul, uh, Korea. It's a regional organization and it was created um, through by Asian activists, uh, and you know they got together ten years ago and said that we need some kind of regional network uh, that will continue and uh, preserve and really advocate for democracy in Asia. How can we do that? Let's bring together uh, civil society organizations, like-minded actors in Asia to create a network so that we could empower each other. So um, the Asia Democracy Network is a regional organization. Uh, it's a network of networks. And if we count all the uh, organ national organizations that are in our network, it sums up to about 300. And we all work um, to advance the democratization of governance in Asia. Um, with uh, with a, such a diverse network uh, comprising over 300 national civil society groups, uh, ADN serves as a vital uh, platform for promoting dialogue, coordination, and networking among stakeholders at the national, regional, and sub-regional levels. Uh, we aim to reimagine democracy that is relevant and relatable to Asia's narrative, and uh, to promote that democracy is not a, uh, a culture of a certain region of the world, rather it's a universal one. Uh, therefore, uh, we are committed to promote Asia's democracy narrative and reclaim our rightful civic space and democratic values. Um, ADN works to empower organizations already working towards democracy by providing them space for dialogue and coordination. We bring them together, we amplify each other's efforts, uh, learn from each other, and develop an action plan for a more coordinated effort towards democracy. Um, ADN, we also educate uh, each other by developing the capacity of its of our members and partners and young advocates of democracy. We also work with governments and local players through diverse programs. And importantly, ADN initiates advocacy campaigns, activities, programs, and supports projects to address urgent needs that arise in the journey of democracy. Um, so to kind of explain the main priority pillars, uh, uh, we aim to strengthen democratic unity and solidarity uh, to move forward together in, strength, in strengthening to complement and support democracy advocates, civil society, and like-minded governments. Uh, we aim to cultivate the next generation of democracy advocates as it is vital in sustaining the movement in the long term and bringing forth the next generation of democracy leaders. Uh, and ADN is also involved in various frameworks and themes of democracy to improve and strengthen the quality of democracy 
And at the moment, we believe that the quality of democracy starts at the local level and uh, that we must join efforts between local authorities and the local community. And we strive uh, to work with local actors to bring them together and work on uh, promoting local democracy. So you know, I explained a lot of uh, you know the priorities and vision and goals, and how does that kind of uh, translate into actual activities? Go ahead and uh, explain. Go uh, take you through what we do in action. Um, so our network members, uh, we uh, uh, focus on building a platform and strengthening solidarity uh, with our network members. We work tirelessly on improving human rights and progressing democracy. And as a regional network organization, we do not uh, look to duplicate any uh, ongoing efforts of the region, but to identify the gaps and break down silos of our members to bring uh, synergy and coordination to all of our efforts towards our main core values, which is uh, progressing democracy and human rights in Asia. In ADN, we strive uh, to build these platforms to convene democracy advocates in order to spark uh, these synergies and corporations uh, breaking down thematic and generational uh, silos. Uh, we also focus on providing training and education for the general public uh, on democracy and human rights to create a fundamental culture of awareness of our rights. We also aim to provide spaces of learning for civil society organizations, as well as young uh, youth leaders uh, to gain skills uh, to be self-resilient uh, so these pictures are uh, from our annual uh, youth leadership program that we have. Uh, this was uh, held in uh, Gwangju, Korea, one of the key cities in Korea that has a very, very deep uh, dem uh, democracy movement history. Um, uh, we also, of course, importantly, uh, work on advocacy campaigns. Uh, we, uh, through advocacy campaigns, we try to elevate Asia's democracy narrative. Uh, we convene, uh, coordinate campaigns with other regional actors uh, in Asia to raise awareness on uh, dire issues. For example, uh, you know, when the Hong Kong uh, crisis was happening, when Myanmar uh, crisis was happening, you know, uh, in partnership with our regional partners, ADN convened uh, regional groups to strategize how we could uh, do advocacy campaigns on a regional and global level. And, uh, uh, we respond to crisis and attacks on human rights defenders. We do advocacy campaigns for any human rights defenders who may uh, be, uh, you know, unlawfully detained or, uh, you know, persecuted for expressing their, you know, fundamental freedoms. Um, and some, and also we use very diverse ways of advocacy and just wanted to share some pictures. Uh, this is a, uh, we did a partnership with um, uh, a or organization in Bangkok uh, who does, uh, who holds uh, art, uh, art exhibitions, photo exhibitions. And this was a uh, photo exhibition, art exhibition uh, to highlight uh, what's been happening in Myanmar. Um, and we also work with uh, Hong Kongers in exile, and we uh, work with them to hold a solidarity event in London, uh, ex exhibiting as well through art, as well uh, as through uh, presentations about what's happening in Hong Kong and how the uh, Hong Kongers in exile are working together to promote uh, democracy in Hong Kong. Uh, we also... Um, we do at times of crisis when democracy significantly declines and human rights are deteriorated. Uh, ADN responds through service assistance, uh, regional stakeholder strategy consolidation, regional campaign coordination uh, of that sort. By all means, uh, we don't specialize in uh, uh, you know democracy crisis response because there's already so many established. Uh, organizations in the region as well as on the international level that uh, specialize in this. Uh, we only uh, fill in the gaps where we can uh, where we can to provide any type of assistance. And for example, um, when a lot of Hong Kong uh, activists had to go in exile, we tried to you know help those relocate. Uh, when Afghanistan collapsed, uh, we worked with uh, international actors to relocate human rights defenders. And as well, uh, when Myanmar, um, the coup happened, you know, we uh, tried to support uh, the activists on the ground 
uh, with uh, financial support to you know uh, better continue their movement. Um, we also uh, do community research. Uh, we conduct community research to better understand uh, the impacts of uh, you know uh, impacts to democracy in Asia. Um, and the reason why we uh, do community research is also to empower our local communities uh, that through evidence-based research that they conduct um, can be uh, used to advocate their uh, campaigns. And as well, uh, also we want to produce material that is a little bit easier to digest uh, for um, you know, the average uh, you know, community leader or average citizen. Uh, so the two, these are the two, we've been focusing on illiberal influence, uh, especially uh, China's uh, influence in uh, a lot of the Asian countries and how that impacts democracy, human rights. And these are the two reports that we have uh, released thus far. Um, and uh, lastly, we, Asia Democracy Network has a medium arm uh, and it's our uh, media platform where uh, we have, uh, you know, we try to elevate the on the ground uh, narratives and stories of what's happening uh, when it comes to democracy and human rights in Asia. Uh, we it's a, a network of local journalists who writes for us. Uh, it's news on human rights and democracy issues in Asia that is usually not picked up by mass media. And uh, we through the Asia Democracy Chronicles, uh, we also uh, work to release special in-depth investigative reports. And uh, we uh, also uh, are aiming to work with our Asia Democracy Research Network, which is our sis sister network uh, of think tanks in Asia, and to take their uh, academic research and we kind of create it into a digestible, readable, reader-friendly version and post it on Asia Democracy Network. That is kind of in the process at the moment, uh, but uh, our Chronicles is your one-stop shop for any uh, information about what's happening in uh, a lot of the countries in Asia when it comes to democracy and human rights. And just to share some of our network members, um, we have uh, 11 network members. These are all regional networks, uh, very thematic focused. Um, Forum Asia is a network of organizations, uh, of human rights organizations. ONFREL, Asia Network for Free Elections, is a network of election monitoring organizations in Asia and so forth. So for Asia is built up of, of regional members that are networks. And then we also work with uh, international partners as well. So um, I guess just to add, um, you know, because I am here uh, talking at a open data uh, open house, I think just by listening to the past uh, two presentations, I think it would be great to use a lot of this open data access with a lot of the activists on the ground that uh, we uh, are uh, we are working with and how we could work together to synergize to create better advocacy campaigns, uh, how we could use open data to uh, you know provide evidence-based uh, uh, research or campaign materials. And I think there is a great way, I think it's a great start to uh, collaborate and uh, and work together and um, it'd be great to kind of uh, come up with much more ideas to uh, better progress democracy in Asia. So thank you. And I'll uh, stop my presentation there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sue, for highlighting the uh, work that uh, the Asia uh, Democratic uh, network has been doing so this is very interesting and like you rightly pointed i think there is a huge scope for us to use open data and like any kinds of technology for more uh, evidence-driven or data-driven advocacies or uh, initiatives and definitely like the 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 presentations the uh that like you recently listens i think this is a very good start uh, uh the the icebreaker for our, our networks and definitely from open data charter from our individual level also we can keep this discussion ongoing and see how we can like uh, strengthening this uh, civic space in uh, asia region too so thank you so much for the presentations and highlighting all the uh, great work that you have been doing uh so yeah we, we have come to the uh, final presentation for these sessions 
So without being uh, further delayed, I would love to welcome uh, Jinoi uh, from uh, SAI Foundations uh, for the final sharing and presentation. So uh, Jinoi is the uh, open data uh, enthusiast, uh, Wikimedians who uh, delights in curating and contributing to open data initiatives, various Wikimedia projects, initiatives such as open, from the uh, open data Kerala. Uh, so he excels as an electrical uh, design engineer while continuing to pursue his passions for open data and everything. So thank you so much, Jinoy, for uh, joining us. Uh, over to you for your uh, settings and presentations. Do you also need uh, the slides or? Uh, yeah, uh, yes, I need our access to the slides. Um, so uh, thank you, Nigesh, for the uh, wonderful in intro. So so myself, Jinoy, uh, so... Uh, I'll sh start sharing my screen. Yeah. I hope my screen is visible to you all, right? Uh, yes, you know, yes. Uh, so, so, yeah, so, uh, uh, so the Open Data Kerala initiative is uh, one of the initiatives that we have uh, started in 2020. Um, so you most of you may have heard about the floods that happened in Kerala in 2018-19. And after that, pan uh, there, there was a pandemic occurred. Uh, so during that period, uh, we have uh, started this initiative for contributing to Open data initiative by collaborating different different organizations, different different cooperating with different st stakeholders. So, uh, so uh, as I said, the initiative was started in two thousand twenty. Uh, uh, that we have started creating the administrative level mapping of the state of Kerala. Uh, because at that time uh, it was in draft stage only the this uh, the policy has not been uh, published so we started this uh, initiative for creating curating the information about the open data and connecting with different different stakeholders so the the work that one or the one organization is doing they are contributing those information to the open data so the work is not getting duplicated but sometimes we can see the one organization will be doing some uh, open data initiative, mapping initiative. Another organization will be doing the same uh, type of work. So it is like a, a, a waste of time and waste of money. And also we collaborated with the open street map community in Kerala, as well as uh, different organizations, Wikipedia communities, uh, Wiki, Wikimedians, other, other Wikimedians and we uh, some other organization with have similar mindset we have collaborated with them and we started a mapping activities so uh, at that time we have uh, created a portal called open data kerala portal where people can uh, contribute to the open data initiative and they can we publish those in information at open license so after that, we uh, registered one of the organization because in India, we have some uh, limitations for getting the foreign funds. Uh, we, uh, we have some FCRA uh, restrictions in India to get the foreign funds and all. So for getting the crowd source funding from inside uh, India itself, we started a organization for uh, crowdsourcing uh, uh, money as well as uh, resources and all. Uh, we started this organization in 2022 and uh, we uh, registered this NGO, Sahya. So under 2020, uh, while we started uh, doing the mapping activities, uh, at that time there was no uh, open map available for the state of Kerala for the administrative boundary of uh, level 8 and level 10. So when we started in 2020, we started mapping nearly 1,200 LSGs in Kerala. There's one of the administrative different different uh, divisions in Kerala. That work has been uh, been was uh, been notified by one of the leading newspapers in Malayalam. So they have taken that. Uh, we, they are ask us how we created that those map, and they have taken 
the help of our volunteers for creating uh, uh, data uh, for the elections in Kerala. So that's catch uh, many of the uh, uh, eyes of the, many of the other leading newspapers in Kerala. So we get numerous number of emails, we got numerous number of scores, how we publish those data, how we got those information. Actually, the work was completely done by uh, free of course, by our volunteers at their own free time. So this wonderful map uh, they published on that uh, newspaper and as, as also they are creator, uh, given the credit to the uh, open seat map community volunteers in Kerala in the newspaper. Most of the time, uh, the newspapers or other medias while using that creative work, they will not be, sometimes they will not be giving the credit to the who created the, those work. But at that time, they are created on the newspaper, they are cre uh, added the credit from the, where the information they have got. And uh, as because of that, we got numerous number of calls. So on the front page, as well as uh, almost all the, uh, on the that edition, on the mid uh, center page, as well as uh, two, three pages, they are given that map, which are all the maps that was created by our volunteers during that time. So after that, uh, on the time of uh, pandemic, uh, we didn't have the, the map of the testing centers available nearby uh, each of the individuals. During the time of lockdown, people are uh, facing issues like uh, traveling to longer distance for guests getting their tested. Uh, so we created a map portal for accessing to the public, uh, which is the nearest location testing centers so they can go to the nearby test centers whether it is available or not the appointment is there or not they can check on that website so on as well as we also publish the historical data of the vaccination in the state of Kerala because at that time there was a different different portals available there but uh, most of the time the information is like uh, scattered, uh, scattered uh, there and all and they can access which all uh, how many vaccination has to be done which is the nearest vaccination centers so we created a port uh, visualization for them how vaccination has been done as well as a, po uh, a web portal for checking whether the vaccination is uh, available there or not so and uh, during that time because uh, during that time people most of the people are uh, under uh, or sitting at, uh, at home working from home and all so we started a ward level mapping, which is at at been ten level mapping. So uh, at the time we didn't have the good number of information. The government have the PDF format map data because from the PDF format data, yeah, we can uh, use those information for uh, analyzing those things, and we can't. It is uh, something the information is like a, uh, not completely useful because since it cannot not be reproduced, so. Some of the volunteers started uh, reproducing, started mapping those information in OpenStreetMap. And we uh, there are more than uh, nearly 21,000 wards in Kerala. So the people started from the north side. Some of the people, uh, volunteers have started the mapping. Some of the central, bush, central region, some of the volunteers started mapping those things. And nearly uh, right now, almost uh, a 50, 40, 50 percentage of ward level mapping has been completely done and it has been linked to the uh, Wikidata, which is one of the open data platforms. So people can access those things from the Wikidata as well as uh, on the Wikipedia articles in the Malayal Wikipedia article or uh, if it's in, in, on the English Wikipedia article, the people can access those information. The map file information will be coming from the OpenStreetMap and the data level information will be coming from the Wikidata. So uh, after that, we uh, started a map portal uh, so people can uh, like uh, access those information because so many information are, are available on the internet but uh, people can't uh, people will not be knowing how to access those information how to download those information how to reuse those information so we created a portal for that for uh, they can uh, check on the portal they can uh, search for the uh, location or they can search for the which are the uh, administrative un uh, unit they need a map so they can go to the portal and get, they can uh, download those map files uh, like in the different different formats so different based on different amenities different uh, things 
they can download the map from uh, this portal. So if they are mapping the things in the OpenStreetMap, all the information will be uh, publicly available uh, under open license and people can access those information. They can create a custom map, they or can they can print out those map or they can use those information on their website. So we create a portal for that. So like uh, if you open the portal, we can uh, see the geospatial details of the location. Uh, they can uh, download the bound shape files. They can uh, visualize those information. So most of the information will be coming from the Wikipedia as well as a wiki data. So some uh, if people are want to update something, they can uh, go directly to the Wikipedia as well as uh, on the wiki data. They can update those information that will be uh, updated on this portal. So this portal is right now in the alpha stage. So we are working on this portal for some other improvement. So we have got some funding from the humanitarian mapping team, whole uh, team. So we are working on that project right now. So uh, as well as we got the opportunity to collaborate on one of the institution for creating a geospatial water mapping. So we have mapped the water ponds. Uh, we have mapped the uh, fields, the uh, paddy fields and uh, what all uh, area, what all activities are going on. We map the, all the rivers on that location. So it is a, a government in project. We are collaborating with one of the government institution for uh, this mapping activity. So we organize some of the, we uh, organize some conference in Kerala for collaborating with some of the stakeholders for collaborating what all activities they are doing. So we can come together, we can, uh, combine our work, we can uh, publish our information under our license. So we organized on the last year, we organized uh, one mapping in, uh, initiative uh, at that time. Uh, as well as we uh, are uh, going to that institution, we collaborated with the same institution for releasing the herbarium uh, de details that are available on their site under uh, open license on the Wikimedia Commons. So people can uh, reuse those information, people can have structured data, and this is a linked data. People can uh, share those information, and check those information from different data source. So the, on the latest last two, three months, we are working on a, a project called Wikibase. So if you are similar, uh, knowing about the wiki data, you can see that it is a similar interface. So people, it is a linked data source. So if we are sharing some of the information, the CSV or Excel format, it is not a linked data set. People can download those information, they can reuse that information, but it is not, not a linked data set. So it, a wiki base or wiki data is a linked data source, which is a five-star uh, data source. So uh, some people, if they need to connect from different data sources, they can uh, access all information if people from different wiki base can access our wiki base using some uh, like uh, creating some small queries like this. So we created a wiki base uh, for a testing stage. We are right now on the st testing stage. We are not uh, not completely published all this information. Public can view those information. They can download those information. But right now it is not a uh, public can't contribute to this platform. But later, yeah, if we are planning to open uh, this platform for public to contribute to the data related to, to Kerala. So uh, that's uh, what's going on. So thank you. So if you have any questions, yeah, we can discuss about that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zinoy, for uh, sharing the uh, inspiring and impactful uh, work of Open Data uh, Kerala uh, from the SIA Foundation. This is very interesting. Uh, and I really hope to see the elections map ongoing from the on on the like uh, work continued in the upcoming elections too. I think that's going yeah. to be very impactful, and uh, has the similar stories like Nepal, how disasters or DRA related activities has boosted uh, the OSM uh, related activities. I think that's it's also very interesting, and I'm personally really looking forward to learn how we can like mobilize or better use Wikidata for all these initiatives. I think this is very interesting. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, sharing and the presentation. Uh, so with your presentation, I think we are uh, in the end of um, all, all the presentation. We have listened to all these stories and the uh, work uh, they have been doing in their respective countries or the respective regions, uh, like utilizing open data, the technology or uh, civic uh, innovations uh, for uh, many of the uh, work. Uh, 
so uh, we are almost at the end of the time that we have decided uh, we are all, uh, like at the uh, in nepal it's 10 15 am so we are almost done with all the presentation so if we have like any additional questions uh, from the uh, the presenter themselves or the participants uh, are joining feel, please feel free to like ask we might have like space for one one question maybe <laughs> uh, one or like one and a half questions so let's try to keep it very short and uh, uh, informal and uh, once uh, the uh, the questions and like sessions is done we can like uh, say uh, goodbye for today uh, so Stephen over to you for your questions uh, thanks. So it, it's it's not so much a question. Maybe it's a it's a call to everyone. Um, so three great presentations. I'm sorry I was a bit late and I kind of dropped out a few times. But um, it, kind of my summary of this is uh, policy and government engagement, um, democracy and and civic sort of intent, and technical wrangling and data stewardship. Right. So three aspects that are very clear to anyone who's been in the open data space for a long time you know, kind of purposefully, why are we doing it? Um, in terms of what existing institutions, what why are we challenged by the encumbrances or the ways that we're being blocked? And then fundamentally beyond that, how are we actually doing it? And what's a good way to do it that is technically helpful and low, low friction, easy, things like that. Um, my, my reflection on open data after the last 10 years, and particularly, I guess, the opportunities looking forward is just simply that all of these things have to come together with a clear understanding that we must move forward. That reality itself is telling us um, what's going to happen. Uh, all of these practices, all of these ambitions and all of these exciting developments that we've got are nothing compared to the challenges that are facing us, um, that are ahead of us. And it takes all of us in all of the capacity that we have moving things forward um, to really lean into the problem. And it will take another 10 to 100 years to get this right. Um, my thing for Open Data Day, and actually, again, reflecting on all of these, is what more can we do and how more can we connect? And to what extent will we be able to come together and leverage each of, the, each of our strengths, each of our passions, and each of our skills? Um, that's kind of an open question. Um, but yeah, great, great talks, awesome. Uh, thank you, thank you so much, Stephen. I think that's uh, that's a very interesting perspective, and I also like kind of always think about that, uh, like in terms of like how we can like uh, build that stewardship, uh, uh, like like keeping that open for all the presenters uh, presenters that we have today. Maybe like uh, like if you have like any uh, final thoughts that you really wanted to share in terms of how we can like proceed forward. Uh, in terms of like building this uh, open data ecosystem in the Asia regions, uh, maybe we can like keep that it very short in 30 seconds or <laughs> uh, somewhere. So uh, like uh, the final thoughts from all the presentation is starting from uh, the Thai. Like anything that you really wanted to share as, as part of it, like uh, like the final thought. Um, okay. Um... Just, just to echo to what uh, Stefan just mentioned about the uh, the policy and the engagement with the government. Uh, while I uh, mentioned about the you know um, the new uh, open data policy, the upcoming you know because still not yet uh, how uh, the draft you know. So uh, I'm was thinking that what we can do together in terms of like uh, mapping out you know maybe looking at the um, you know the modality you know which country that we should uh, i'm not saying that we have to adapt but maybe learn from those countries and see um, at the national level you know what the key principle that we should integrate into the open data policy of law you know so uh, by having the you know like community like us and uh, other experts you know we can maybe can come up with some maybe checklist or uh, I mean, document that can guide us, you know, when it comes to the discussion with the government. So uh, that might be uh, something that we could work together in the upcoming coming month, you know. So I expect that the Cambodian open data policy might be take uh, at least maybe one year or maybe more than that. It depends. But uh, I guess that they also try to speed up the process as well. So hopefully that might be we can have a checklist or maybe a document that can support us. Uh, um, when it comes to the engagement with the policy development. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Dai. Uh, Miko, over to you, like your final thoughts uh, and opinions. There has been a significant uh, effort in the past to actually create a, an open data network across different organizations in the region. When I was still working at the Open Data Lab in Jakarta, we actually tried to do that as well. Uh, but there has not been quite a traction for that. Um, my, 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 my dream is actually to have... Uh, an ILDA-like organization within the region uh, where, you know, this continuous uh, encouragement, learning, and also, uh, uh, you know, encouraging each other actually happens uh, quite significantly. And so, yeah, if uh, there are opportunities to discuss those with uh, several like-minded here, that would really be a good thing to do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. I think uh, definitely looking forward to like the upcoming discussions for this one. Uh, so over to you for your like final thoughts. Um, I, I learned a lot today. Um, just listening to all the great work that's been happening in the open data scene, and just uh, got excited with um, you know, ADN. We've been also trying to see how we could better engage governments. How do we make sure that uh, the voices of those on the ground, our activists really gets to those people in power and how do we really impact policy change? And uh, I think uh, collaboration through open data would be would be an avenue to do that. So uh, this was definitely a learning experience for me and I hope that we could keep this connection uh, going and then see how we could work together uh, to kind of create change in, in the region. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sui. I think looking forward to it. So I think everyone, like all three presentation, uh, presenters are also definitely looking forward to see how uh, we can work with ADN uh, to support the work uh, that you have been doing. Uh, Zeno, over to you. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. as Sue so said, yeah, it was uh, nice to meet uh, all the people from different regions, how their work is going on. Uh, yeah, it would be nice to collaborate with uh, each every community members, how the how their work is going on and how we can implement those things in our region as well as because uh, so many uh, initiatives within good will be uh, they are doing very good initiative in their, their region that can be taken implemented on our region. So it's uh, nice to talk with, uh, to know about uh, every initiative and looking forward to have collaboration to other members. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zune, uh, Zinui. Uh, looking forward to it too also. Uh, so yeah, with that being said, I think we are uh, in the end of Open Data Open House session. So this is the final session, as I earlier mentioned, uh, for this year. And I think uh, they, we discussed a really interesting perspective from all different countries and all different learnings. Uh, and I personally very much look forward to collaborate with each of you uh, so we have been like uh, talking formally, informally in many forums and uh, uh, like uh, interestingly uh, as uh, also like uh, Miko has been like doing all these related work related to the ecosystem from the uh, state of open data, the GBG, uh global data parameter. I think we can like kind of interlink all these activities and see how we can we can like build this regional alliances and also like uh, like embrace how we can like uh like see the cross data border flow cross border data flow might work how we can like see if the data from nepal and the india are inter currently we are like kind of struggling with the inter inter country uh data flow but i think that on the broader aspect i think that we see uh there is a huge opportunity for us to like collaborate uh, in the technical, non-technical, advocacies, awareness, research, any kinds of projects. And uh, let's keep these discussions uh, flowing through emails, through other forum also. And from Open Data Charter also, we really look forward to like organize this kinds of learning, sharing events so that we can like create the bond between each other and also see if we can like build some collaborative projects. Uh, see if there are organizations, governments who are happy to like endorse open data charters in their work and expand our reach also. So we really look forward to it. And with that being said, uh, thank you so much once again. Uh, we'll be uh, uh, sharing the recordings, the uh, learnings from this uh, uh, open house uh, to the wider audience, to our social media, to our blogs also. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, from the uh, on behalf of Open Data Charter teams and the board members also.
and really looking forward to like uh, keep this communications ongoing. And with that being said, uh, have a good re uh, remaining day and uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Thank you, Bye. Thanks, folks. Thank you so much.